Welcome. Welcome, everyone. I hope everyone is getting a seat. But for the sake of time, I think we'll get started. Let's find a seat. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Christian Chito Chirigiri. I'm the Digital Peace Building Policy Officer at Search for Common Ground. And tonight, I'll be your MC. Now, after months of planning, it is really wonderful to welcome you here at Fort Mason and online for the kickoff kick kick event of our conference on designing tech for social cohesion. While there are several, several challenges to technology in advancing social cohesion, this conference is really about exploring the potential that we all bring collectively in this room to develop a new generation of tech products that offer design affordances and algorithms optimized for pro-social content. Now, before I tell you a little bit more about what we have lined up for you this evening, please allow me to share a few words about why this particular conference is important to me. So I come from Bukavu. How many people in the room know Bukavu? Let me just check. I can see one, two, three, four, all right. So Bukavu is a small town in Eastern Congo. And for those who know a little bit more about the Congo, it is a country that has gone through almost three decades of conflicts. And growing up in this context, I witnessed the destruction that conflicts can cause to human life. And as we speak right now, there are millions of people who are displaced or who are going through a lot of turmoil as a result of conflicts. Now, noticing that the plight of the Congolese people is not unique and that indeed in several parts of the world, as we know, Syria, Afghanistan, South Sudan, name it, there are other communities around the world divided by conflicts during my master's program, it has been very important to think of ways that we can build supportive online communities for youth in conflict-affected contexts to inspire each other through storytelling. Now, while I was doing my master's program at the University of Notre Dame in 2016, together with some colleagues who were part of my cohort coming from so many of those divided countries, we started a storytelling initiative, an online storytelling initiative called Peacemaker 360, which only sought to create a space for young people to share their stories and to ship. Colleen McGill, Digital Minister of Taiwan, Audrey Tang, Andrew Konya, and Danish Masood about how they have designed tech to support social cohesion. And after the presentation, We'll have a time for Q&A so that we can also have your thoughts and reflections on what will have sh been shared tonight. Now I have one question for you. Are you ready? <laughs> Great, if you're ready, thank you for that. I'd like now more louder a round of applause to help me welcome on the stage Tristan Harris, co-founder and executive director at the Center for Human Technology. Lisa Shirk. Professor at the University of Notre Dame, and Shamil Idris, CEO of Search for Common Ground. Thank you. So the floor is sure. Great. Wow. Um, it is uh, honestly such an awesome opportunity to be here with all of you. Um, when a year and a half ago, I think some of these conversations got started and we had on our podcast, how many people here have listened to Your Undivided Attention, the podcast? Awesome, quite a lot. Um, that is the name of our podcast at the Center for Humane Technology. Um, and it was actually after the social dilemma came out and after the US elections that, um, and actually after hearing from a lot of trust and safety people who worked inside the companies, uh, 
Francis Haugen, um, many, many folks who were giving us some information about how dangerous and how, not just polarizing, but how much Facebook and, and these platforms were en enhancing conflict. And we really wanted to explore, like, what can we do about this? And we wanted to talk to the best people in the world, and this is what they do. And you know, a few organizations and names came up and searched for common ground. Um, we had a, you know, a really fantastic conversation on the techniques that, that you all use. We talked to Braver Angels. We talked to um, you know, the relational therapists about how do you do depolarization in relationships. Because we realized that the insights that you would need to address the problem are not just going to be how do you rank content on a screen differently. It comes down to that human experiential aspect of how do human beings connect with each other? What creates a sense of earnestness and trust? How do you create good faith communication rather than bad faith communication? And there's all these subtle elements about what makes design for human vulnerabilities um, work well. And actually in our work, uh, the Center for Humane, the word humane comes from my co-founder, uh, is a Raskin. His father started the Macintosh project at Apple. Um, back in like 1980. And he wrote a book called The Humane Interface. And humane meant um, to be respectful of human needs and considerate of human frailties. And he meant that back in the day talking about the frailties of an individual mind. Like your mind has short-term memory. You can remember seven plus or minus two things. That's why phone numbers are seven digits long because we want you to remember them and credit card numbers are 16 digits long because we want you to forget them. Um, but those are individual frailties of the human mind. Then when you look out at societal frailties, societal sensitivities, how do you design for the sensitivities in a society? And I think being humane is about how do we design in a way that is respectful and honoring of the wounds and the conflicts and the, the subtleties of how conversation and connection works. And the people who have those insights are not the people who happen to just get hired because of their resume, said they did these you know, engineering things and computer science degrees at universities. Uh, they're going to take the insights of people like you in this room. And so just to kind of bring it full circle, I'm honestly so excited that this is finally happening because um, we have really, really wanted this set of communities to come together for a long time. The peace builders in the room, the technologists, I want to thank David Jay at the Center for Humane Technology for um, helping to kick this off. And um, one of the things Lisa just asked me to briefly speak about is, um, you know, we, we had a podcast episode with my friend Daniel Schmarktenberger called A Problem Well Stated is a Problem Half Solved. And it's a quote from Charles Kettering that, you know, it's like if you ask Einstein how to solve a problem, he would spend 95% of his time defining the problem and then 5% of the time actually addressing it. And um, polarization, conflict, there's many different forms. We all know the business model of these companies is a problem. But um, one of the frames that we wanted to talk about is, is a shared vocabulary for some of the problems. And the reason that polarization is so particularly toxic is that there are many different industries that have externalities that dump harms onto the balance sheet of society. If an oil company has an oil spill, that dumps harm onto the balance sheet of society. But an oil spill doesn't make the government less coherent at regulating and stopping the next oil spill. Whereas if Facebook and Twitter and YouTube cause a polarization spill, that polarization spill uh, confuses the government because now everyone believes different sets of facts. They feel constantly in conflict. They're not primed to say, what is the good thing I think this other side is saying? So the government becomes less coherent at regulating and, and addressing any problem, whether it's climate change, social inequality, social justice, anything that you care about. And so the real problem that we are often um, recently trying to frame in terms of social media is this downward spiral loop that unregulated social media optimizing for engagement um, creates a more incoherent, polarized, simplistic, angry society that is less able to trust institutional responses to any problem, which means those problems don't get addressed, which then leads tech to go unregulated, which allows it to continue causing the downward spiral on a more polarized society and onward and onward. And so that's the, the challenge of a polarization spill. And I just want to say that um, when Francis Haugen testified before Congress uh, a year and a half ago, uh, she 
uh, blew me away because I saw her do something no one had ever done in the 10 years that I had been working in this, in this space, which is she actually created a brief and momentary consensus in Congress, in the Senate, where I saw Republicans and Democrats agree we have to actually do something about this problem. And we don't really have differences on the issue. We can agree to do something. And so I saw her create this consensus. And I literally, I was in a hotel room and I cried because for someone working on this for so long and wanting to see change happen, it was so moving to see her accomplish that. And the next day, Twitter amplified viral stories about her on different sides, um, one of which was that she was a political operative. And another one was that um, this was actually all a plant by the government to regulate free speech. And she was actually kind of a, a plant. And anyway, there was like five different crazy stories about her. And the senator that she was supposed to meet with the next day actually ended up canceling his meeting with her because he said, my base wouldn't like it if I met with you because you're a democratic political operative. So this is like tragic irony. The very problem we're trying to solve is broken down because the polarization spill in society by viral hearsay and polarized takes on everything broke consensus on the very topic that is the basis of how we're going to get consensus or not. And so this is a central problem to all the other problems that we want to solve in society. And in this room, I do think that if you really treat this seriously, like what is the work that you want to get done here? What kind of common vision of um, a framework for technology that actually strengthens social co cohesion? How can we walk away with a common vision and a framework for what that can look like? And I want to point out you know, the good work by New Public and Pro Social Design. We need a common design patterns library. Also, Bridging Systems, the work of Jonathan Stray and Aviva Vidya. Um, we need good examples of how technology can be designed to rank for and bridge consensus, to create shared identity, to create shared care, um, and shared fate for the future that we have. Because we have um, very deep problems that, that are um, coming at us very quickly. So I think that's just all I want to say for now. I'm really, really so excited you all came here. Thank you. Thanks, Tristan. It was great to hear you start that out. And it was after that podcast session, the conversation you and Aza and I had for about 40 minutes afterwards that gave birth originally to this. And I'm, I'm so thrilled to be here, and especially to see who's in the audience tonight. Um, and for all the work that all those organizations did that were cited by Christian when we started, uh, it's, there's no single person more responsible for us all being here today than, than Dr. Shirk. Uh, so special hand to you, Lisa. Thank you. <clears throat> So uh, we're talking about um, uh, launching a council on technology and this thing, which sounds like a communicable disease. So I'm going to try and define what, what we mean by it. Um, I want to do that, though, through the lens of the field that emerged over the last 75 years, specializing in how you build social cohesion, which is peace building. And peace building really, the modern field of peace building, really grew out of the twin uh, devastations of World War I and World War II. Um, and World War I, until then, nearly the most devastating conflict in human history, killing over 17 million people, um, and almost leading us to establish a system to prevent interstate war again, um, uh, but failing to do so, leading to World War II, which killed by far more people than any other conflict in human history until then, over 60 million people, which was finally triggered the political will and the support to establish something like a peace-building system, which for the 20th century and until now largely looked something like this, that this is the way that peace would be sought, uh, mainly by representatives of member states, state-to-state -state diplomacy, almost always by men um, meeting behind closed doors, forging peace agreements. And for all the deficiencies of the system, for all of the double standards of how the supposedly international standards were being applied, et cetera, et cetera, and all of those criticisms were true, um, it's still important to recognize something. Don't worry. Don't even read every word on that. This is the worst graph. However, what's important about this graph is that that system was largely set up to prevent another war between the great powers. 
because that would have caused so much devastation. And this graph basically shows every plot point there is 25 year periods. Um, and um, it ranks from the year 1500, uh, how, what percentage of those years had wars going on between the great powers in each of those periods. And you can see that it wasn't until 1950 that that system was set up that it finally dropped to zero and stayed there for the longest time, longest period in, in recorded human history. Um, and even if you look at it, not just in terms of state to state war, but all kind of violent conflicts. Um, you looked at the number of people killed as a, vault, uh, as a result of violent conflict, you see that the figures dropped substantially to a very sustained period of the lowest levels in recorded history. That uptick towards the end we'll talk about in a second. And as levels of violent conflict dropped, every other measure of human well-being not only improved but exploded to an unprecedented degree. Whether you look at what happened in, from 1950 forward on life expectancy, child mortality rates, um, whether you look at the literacy rates, um, you can look at, uh, this is a complicated graph as well, but as you see the number of recognized um, uh, states expand substantially from less than 50 to almost 200, the key thing here is the proportion of them that are democratic, those two blue portions, and you see that explode from 1950 going forward. Again, you see a dip uh, recently. On every measure, with the important exception of the health of our climate. We'll set that aside for now. But you now zoom in on this latter period, we see these bumps, and especially from 2010 until today, this increase in the number of people killed as a result of violent conflict. And part of the challenge is that violent conflict, the nature of violent conflict started to change. It became much more democratized. There wasn't just states that could go to war and kill large numbers of people. You started to see non-state actors be able to devastate and destabilize entire countries and regions to an extent that previously was only really state armies that could do. Whether you were talking about drug cartels that had evolved from urban phenomenon into national, regional, and sometimes even globally armed groups, or ideologically motivated identity-based groups like ISIS or other groups committing terrorist acts, or the Hammerskin Nation, the largest global uh, white supremacist group that inspired mass violence uh, from uh, Oslo, Norway, to um, uh, New Zealand, to the, the mosque in New Zealand, to El Paso, Texas. Um, and that state-to-state -state diplomacy system that was set up after World War II can't really deal with non-state actors like that, because they don't sit at the UN. The Sinaloa Cartel, or uh, Al Qaeda, or Hammerskin Nation, they don't recognize states, they don't sit there, they don't participate in those negotiations and those discussions. So what happened really, what's been happening over the last few decades is that we've had to come to grips with the fact that states cannot, can no longer be the primary or the sole agent rather that secures the peace. You cannot replace state to state diplomacy. I'm not saying that, it's still absolutely vital and, and important, it's necessary. But you've seen the real emergence over the last few decades in particular, four especially decades, the last four decades of citizen led diplomacy. And citizen led uh, peace building, excuse me. And citizen led peace building has yielded tremendous benefits. And just a few examples um, um, include, oops, include um, the ending of war. Um, this is a picture of uh, the peace agreement that ended the Mozambique War, which was negotiated by a non-state group, the Rome-based community of San Egidio. Nothing official about these people. They're a lay group. They also played a critical role in uh, keeping the peace between uh, Sudan and South Sudan. My own colleagues I'm very proud to represent here, uh, my Burundian colleagues who were recognized for helping to prevent genocide in their country right after the genocide in neighboring Rwanda. Uh, my other colleagues who were recognized by Secretary Kerry for helping um, support the Iran um, um, nuclear accord that has, his team negotiated. Um, and our friends at International Alert, the UK-based peacebuilding organization, whose organization helped um, uh, convince the government in Christian's country, the Democratic Republic of Congo, to enact new laws that enabled community-based um, uh, mining groups to sell um, legally to European and American and other markets and use the profits to support good works in their local communities, rather than the system being hijacked um, um, in ways that lead, uh, being hijacked to um, the bandit economy that supports rebel groups. Uh, and these are just a few examples, lest anyone think this is uh, about planting a flag on my organization, whatever. This is just a, even this is just a very small percentage of the de dedicated peace building organizations that are out there around the world um, doing extraordinary work. And all of them go about their work slightly differently, but there are a couple elements that we find to be absolutely essential, three in particular, to building social cohesion. 
connection. One is you have to forge some sort of a connection. You use a common interest, a common concern, whatever it might be. Every peace builder. And you do this if you're trying to mediate between two people in your family or between the United States and Iran. You have to move from that connection to collaboration. Dialogue is nice, but it's not sufficient. You have to get people cooperating with each other. In the old days of formal peace processes, they would call these confidence building measures. But again, if you want to build trust between communities, healthy communities, you get people cooperating together. And you drive that cycle of connection and collaboration because it, dry, it fuels that, that social cohesion into real breakthroughs that can lead to the kind of systemic changes that I just gave you examples of. Now, the last couple of years, um, my colleagues worked very hard to try to identify what are the components of a, uh, of a healthy society. And by healthy society, we didn't mean just all good things. Uh, we meant particularly a society that would remain resilient to the inevitable shocks of conflict. Um, because uh, conflict is just like um, um, where we are now in, in, in peace building is, is a lot like where the healthcare industry was when it made this really pivotal shift away from just treating disease to promoting a healthy lifestyle. Recognizing that if you really want to have a powerful impact, you don't just react to the bad, but you actually promote the good. Um, and one of the pivotal and most important pieces of that shift in the healthcare sector was the identification of a set of eight, human, um, eight vital signs of a healthy human body. And there was enough consensus on this now that if you visit a doctor pretty much anywhere in the world, the first thing they're going to do, do is test your eight vital signs, your temperature and your pulse and pain, threshold, pain levels and all that kind of stuff. And that will tell them whether um, you know, you, you're, you're, you're likely to um, repel the inevitability of infection, coming in touch with viruses, etc. Um, or whether you need some kind of intervention, right? Well, we, we looked at um, not only the work that we did, but we talked to hundreds of our peer organizations, scholars like Dr. Shirk and others, um, the communities where we work all the way ar all around the world, and we identified um, the five, uh, what we believe are essentially the five uh, equivalents for societal, societal health. The first is trust between people, sometimes called horizontal uh, cohesion. The second is trust in institutions, the institutions that govern and serve us. So that could be uh, the police, it could be um, um, there's a COVID outbreak, do people trust the CDC? But it doesn't have to be just government agencies. It could be the media, do we trust what, what we hear in the media? But the trust in the institutions that govern and serve us. The third is a subjective sensitive agency. Do we feel like we can have any impact on, the, the, on, on our future, on our children's future? Um, to be constructive uh, citizens, do we have a pathway, an agency to, to have a constructive impact? Impact. Um, what are the levels of physical violence? And finally, where are resources going? Are they going to reactive things like uh, more police, more prisons, more repressive systems? Or are they going into building trust between people, trust in institutions? Are they going to preventative measures? Are they going to more healthy ways of fostering a healthy community? And these are the five vital signs that we are now testing everywhere that we work, um, both to understand where things stand in that society at the moment, but also to measure the results of the work that we and others are doing. And it's not just that we're, we're doing this with a number of the organizations that I showed. Um, we're doing it with the UN. We're doing it with, with, with others. And the reason that I share that with you all is when Tristan, Aza, and I started talking about um, this, and then Lisa really took it in a, a, whole, a much more practical direction, um, um, we uh, identified social cohesion really as th these three factors, right? That social cohesion is some combination of these three things. Um, trust between people, trust in institutions, and, and the agency for constructive civic engagement. And so kind of boiled down simply, social cohesion is really about trust and agency. Trust and agency. And one of the things that um, brings me here is the, the real terror and the fear of the negative impact that the digital space is having on trust and agency. But on the other side, the unprecedented feeling of, of hope and excitement that literally never in human history have we had the potential to build trust and agency like we do now with some of these tools, technologies, and platforms. And so the, the, the potential here is huge. We're not exploiting nearly as much as we should the positive potential. Uh, but if we do, I think it will really be the golden age for healthy society. So thank you very much. All right, I'm not sure why this isn't working. My slides, can they be drawn up? 
Well, let me start by thanking my colleagues to, for being here and putting their institutions behind this initiative. Uh, now we're way far ahead. So, uh, planet Earth, you know, part of the reason why toxic polarization is so important for us to deal with, it might be the most important problem for us to deal with because of exactly what Tristan said. It prevents the ability for us to make decisions together, to save the planet, to address the climate crisis, to address the pandemic, uh, to address racial injustice, or, or any of the many other problems that we're trying to address in, in Congress or in any other government around the world. Uh, toxic polar polarization is now the obstacle to solving problems. You know, when, we, when computers and the internet started, there was so much hope. There were techno-optimists and techno-solutionists that somehow we were all going to be connected and that this connection was naturally going to lead to peace. And unfortunately now, we know that's not true. <laughs> and we need to be more intentional about the way we are thinking about designing technology and using technology. And so I would say Tristan, is on the tech side thinking about you know the the design of the technology and really has given our community the vocabulary to be able to critique uh, the attention economy um, whether our time is being well spent and, and just what the algorithms are doing to amplify the hate and division online so so grateful to Center for Humane Technology for that vocabulary gift to us and then of course search for common ground the largest peace building organization in the world is is showing us that there's practical skills and there's things that we can do and social cohesion isn't a lofty goal in fact there's thousands of people around the world that have their day jobs doing building bridges and and building peace so the question is what if we designed our digital town squares to enhance our ability to solve problems together that's really the theme of the whole conference and this evening we know that people are already using tools to, to build democracy movements. Um, we know that cohesive tech designs include all kinds of affordances and algorithms that help us humanize each other, develop empathy for each other, being able to close perception gaps where we misperceive each other's beliefs, uh, where we, you know, sort of are using algorithms to find where there's common ground, which we'll talk a lot about today. Uh, so we know that there's ways of designing technology, and this conference is really exploring those. And we know that computer engineers who have a background in social cohesion, even if they've just read about it, or they've thought about it, or talked about it, they are embedding those values into technology, which is then the real payoff of having platforms that serve humanity instead of divide us. I want to give a short story here for context of this conference and how it's situated in this part of California even. So about six months ago, down at Stanford University, just down the road, um, there was a big conference of the trust and safety community. Thank you for those of you in the audience who are part of that community. I was there and there were a lot of us who are interested in, in tech, designing tech for health. Um, but at the at the conference most of the conversation was just how content moderation sort of the trust and safety world of trying to figure out how to reduce toxic harm harmful content online it's not keeping pace it's, it's overwhelming and the former twitter trust and safety lead del harvey she gave a keynote talk and she was on the stage another time and she made a plea that we have to start thinking about the problem of digital harm more like we think of, of public health. And so instead of just fighting disease, we need to get out in front of it and be designing for health. She said that from the stage, we must design for health. But then uh, at the question and answer for her session, I asked the panel of tech, big tech uh, leaders, you know, what's the appetite for designing for health? And I got these shocking <laughs> responses. No, there's not an appetite for designing for health. Uh, we tried that and it didn't work. And designing for health is social engineering and we have to be neutral. And so a, a number of us met at that conference and really, you know, were, were uh, concerned about the level of uh, dismissal of the problem of the design of the platforms currently. 
Uh, we know that the scale of false and hateful information online is increasing. There's cyber armies. There's a growing for-profit disinformation industry um, that amplifies individual producers of, of content. So it's just like uh, what many of the content moderators at the Trust and Safety Conference were saying is they're facing a tsunami of harmful content. They kept using the metaphor of whack-a-mole that just they keep hammering it down and it just keeps coming and coming. Um, and it's particularly bad in the global south where uh, fewer tech companies have staff or, that speak local languages. So we know that polarization existed from the beginning of human life. We're not saying that social media is the only reason uh, toxic polarization exists, but it is amplifying and incentivizing distrust and hate. It's, it's a megaphone for what's already in life. It, it, the way it's designed is making things worse. Uh, and we know that digital hate and disinformation can spill over into real world violence. So it comes off the screen into the real world. It, it doesn't stay there. Uh, and what's concerning is that over the last year, the tech sector has laid off 100,000 tech workers and eliminated or downsized the human rights groups. Uh, and we know, as Tristan mentioned, that political polarization over digital content moderation itself is, is growing. So people don't agree on what kind of content moderation we should have. So it's not a solution to these issues. Um, but as over the last year, uh, a number of us from Search for Common Ground and the Center for Humane Technology conducted research interviews, and we listened to many dozens of tech workers as well as civil society organizations and government workers about the situation with social cohesion and polarization in tech. And really three narratives emerged. The first is it was heard most often from tech workers who describe the problem as really its users, that the computers are just a mirror of society. And they would see themselves as sort of these neutral mirrors of reflecting user-generated content. Um, algorithms can demote or moderate content, but they said, you know, we can't create our own pro-social content to amplify. So there was this sort of narrative that the real problem is the people in the world that are generating harmful content. The second narrative is, is really the Center for Humane Technology, that we narrative, which is that platforms are designed kind of like a digital coliseum where gladiators fight it out. You have a passive audience cheering on and, and becoming very divided. And you know, it's algorithms rather than Roman architecture amplifying the most diverse voices. Um, but, but the digital spaces are not a, a town hall to solve problems, but more like a gladiator arena. The third narrative is that Yes, we need content moderation. Yes, we need tech regulation. And we also need to start designing tech to support social cohesion. And in this model, we have to look at pro-social tech platforms that already exist. We can learn from those tech affordances and algorithms. And that's really what we're here today to do. So we're here for two purposes, to put to rest the skepticism that designing for health is impossible or impractical, and to reject the idea that technology is a neutral mirror. Uh, all tech design involves social engineering. It, the code is embedding values, and we have to be very clear what those values are. Steve Jobs described computers as bicycles for the mind that amplify human energy. But yeah, humans steer the bicycle, but digital tools are also steering human behavior. So the digital code is like the road. Um, so the bicycle can't just go anywhere. It's going to go on the road. Um, and Harvard law professor Larry Lessig kind of tells us this when he, he talks about code is law. So code is embedding um, the rules of interaction it, it is guiding how people can interact with each other and behave. And this is really just another uh, echo of what a B.J. Fogg, Stanford psychology professor, said two decades ago when he wrote the book Persuasive Technology, which also just acknowledged that computers can persuade people and, and nudge people to act in certain ways. 
perhaps this is provocative, but the road to hell is paved with code. And if we want to pave a road out of hell or this toxic polarization that we're in, uh, we need to be thinking about how do we pave a different road with different code. Coding embeds values and that can take us in either direction. I'm out of time, but I'm just going to go quickly through 10 ideas for the Council on Technology and Social Cohesion. They're on the back of the program um, executive summary. We want to institutionalize the co cohesive tech movement. We want a calendar of events that we can share and cross-company forums, matchmaking forums. We want to promote public awareness so people understand that tech can be designed in better ways. We want to incubate pro-social tech, sometimes called peace tech. We want to explore funding models for funding peace tech. We want to train and build capacity, both for civil society and, and UN agencies to be able to use technology more efficiently and to amplify their peace building work, but also to train the tech companies in social cohesion and what this means to embed social cohesion values and peace building processes in their code. We need to measure tech's impacts on toxic polarization. We need better digital indicators and metrics. Uh, we want to improve content moderation by bringing social cohesion processes. Uh, and Colin McGill will be talking about that later today. Uh, we want to protect information ecosystems, really thinking about the interaction between online and offline and, and public interest journalism. We want to explore government regulation to incentivize tech for social cohesion, creating a market signal for the positive contributions of tech, and taxing or sanctioning companies for harmful content. And finally, we want to advocate for the big tech adoption of pro-social affordances and algorithms. And again, we'll talk about that in just a minute. So the way this is going to work is we're going to have um, no questions and answers until the end of the time. So we'll be inviting Tristan and Shamal back to the stage at the end of the program. But for now, I will thank you for your contributions. <laughs> And we are going to have a message from Minister Audrey Tang, um, who is the minister of, of the digital minister of Taiwan. Um, she is a computer engineer herself, and she has participated in the democracy movement in Taiwan, and she has really brought the ideas of embedding values of democracy, participation, inclusion, and finding common ground in technology that can serve governments who are interested in being more transparent and accountable. So she has recorded a message specifically for this conference, and we'll play that now. Uh, the main message is to The main message is to work not just for the people, uh, but with the people. Every year, the human rights organization Civicus, with around 20 regional partners, conduct research about freedom and civic space. And Taiwan has been rated as completely open for three consecutive years. We're the only Asian country with that distinction and the sole Asian green light on this year's Civicus Monitor. So how do we come so far on this path? The key factor is that the internet in Taiwan has developed alongside democratization. Between the lifting of the martial law in 1987 and the presidential election in 96, we saw the popularization of PCs and the wild web in the span of 10 years. So for Taiwanese people, democracy is like a social technology. It can only be enriched through the joint efforts of all. Therefore, our government insists that broadband is a human right, reducing the cost for civic technologies. Our never infrastructure allows everyone to broadcast live from Jade Mountain, Taiwan's highest peak. We believe that a completely open environment with free speech uncensored is 
perfect for letting digital democracy flourish. And with our 23 million citizens using the internet as a space for democracy, we fought off the pandemic with no lockdowns and the infodemic with no takedowns. In 2019, when news about the pandemic just started, our pro-social social media platform here allowed timely response to early warnings. In the face of global challenges, digital democracy has proven to be the most effective solution. This SMS-based contact tracing system is a great example. To eliminate community transmission, contact tracing must be done rapidly and effectively, of course. Inaccurate information will put us in the dilemma of having to choose between protecting privacy and preventing the pandemic. So rolling out a mandatory government app, we think it would only backfire. So instead of centralizing contact tracing data or yielding control to multinational corporations, we sought social sector solutions with the people. Earlier this year, the civic technologists in the G0V or Zero community invented this mechanism of contact tracing based on text messages. We work across sectors with telecom carriers to deploy this one way to SMS system in a week. As you can see, scanning a QR code with the built-in camera, no app download required, setting a toll-free text message, people can keep track of their itineraries. This allows contact tracer to confirm the footprints of infected people in their contact without revealing any private information to venue owners. And this collaboration cannot happen without this strong trust across sectors. Of course, we need to bridge the digital gap for the elderly and visually impaired, so contact tracing can still be done through measures such as handwriting or stamping. When contact tracers apply for information about certain phone numbers, they send a request through the civic platform to browse them. The phone number holder can then reverse audit contact tracers' requests and activities. All records are deleted after 28 days. And because the civic tab originates from a community that has always valued personal data sovereignty, we can respond to new challenges with timely improvements. For instance, text messages sent to 1922 were discovered by a judge assessing a police search warrant. Fortunately, this multi-party secure design prevented police from accessing the mapping between the random codes and specific values. So the judge denied the warrant and publicly questioned the legality of even wiretapping text sent to 182. Following discussions, our Minister of Justice concluded that this SMS does not constitute communication under the Communication Security and Surveillance Act and therefore should not be repurposed for law enforcement, keeping the original civic intent intact. Rule by the people is the original intent of democracy. In the face of global threats such as the pandemic and disinformation, our Taiwan model shows that the world, that this people-public-private partnership with the people can shape a digital democracy. Trusting our citizens to participate in policy making can form shared goals, develop innovative solutions and contribute to the world. Just like reliable infrastructure making our lives safer and more convenient, public infrastructure in the digital realm does the same for democracy. And I've got an example here. Um, in 2015, Civic Technologies invented Airbox, a low-cost air quality tracker adopted by many schools and households balconies here. And citizen science supplemented our government's limited capacity and paved the way for data stewardship and environmental education. And the following year, our government initiated this civil IoT Taiwan program, which the first time we classified infrastructure budget uh, into the digital realm. Uh, and at the time, there were just around 2,000 devices, and today there's tens of thousands. And we move on from the step of sharing data to forming shared goals through AI or assistive intelligence. For instance, in 2015, many passengers welcomed Uber's entry to Taiwan, but also triggered taxi driver discontent. And again, with the help from the G Zero Week of Zero community, we utilize the police system here to invite stakeholders to resonate with each other's feelings. We've learned that shared values are hiding in plain sight. For example, safety is a value on which all parties agree, and a rough consensus was formed around professional license, uh, insurance, and taxes, all ratified in a diversified taxi program in 2016. The same setting also works for multilateral topics. During the past couple of years, the AIT at 40, Digital Dialogues, and Cohack International Hackers 
catechism does use the polis system here with the visual spectrum of ideas. Participants around the world can see where they start compared with others. So we can co-create a norm or a good enough consensus. So I think to close off, we need to institutionalize the rapid deployment of such social innovations. Our presidential hackathon, for example, has been held for four consecutive years with thousands of social entrepreneurs and public servants participating alongside teams from dozens of countries to contribute to the digital public goods. Five teams each year received this trophy, you see, uh, carrying the presidential promise of support in the next fiscal year. So to conclude, I urge all three countries to invest, like Taiwan does, in civic technologies to strengthen democracy, as I've said in our national statement, to give no trust is to get no trust, as democracy we must trust our citizens, and Taiwan can help. I encourage you to watch more of Minister Tang's speeches. She has a TED Talk, and she's just very inspiring in terms of how governments can be using technology to build social cohesion. She mentioned here at the end the Polis platform, and our next speech speaker, Colin McGill, is the co-founder of Polis, and will explain to us how it's worked. You may have noticed in the uh, advertisements for this conference that Wired Magazine has uh, did an article about Polis, uh, because Twitter has adopted the Polis uh, open source code to help with uh, its community notes, previously Birdwatch, um, and called it one of the most exciting innovations in content moderation ever. With that, I will invite Colin McGill to come out, and uh, he'll give a presentation, and then we'll do a little, uh, a few questions. There you go. Thanks. Thanks so much, Lisa. Thanks so much to Lisa and to Tristan and Shamil for the wonderful introduction, and of course to Audrey. Uh, I will point out that uh, my ancestors, the Italians, uh, give us incoerenza for, uh, for incoherence, so it's a particularly relevant gift to the, uh, the conference. And uh, if there's anyone else out there from the social sciences background, I'd also like to thank Tristan and also uh, Lisa for pointing out uh, the varied backgrounds that we bring to social technology. Um, my background is in international relations and political science. I went into tech 11 years ago, and so I have brought a different lens to that, and that's a really fertile area for discussion. I'd love to speak with anybody else here who's coming from that background uh, over the course of the conference. My name is Colin McGill. I am president of the Computational Democracy Project, uh, which is a 501c3 uh, nonprofit here in the US, uh, formerly CEO of Polis, which was a for-profit startup um, founded in 2012. Uh, Polis is an open source platform uh, for efficiently gathering and making meaning of perspectives at scale uh, using machine learning. The initial impetus of the platform uh, was motivated by the uh, vision of uh, social media, specifically Twitter, in the Green Movement uh, and Arab Spring and in Occupy Wall Street uh, as successful in mobilization yeah, of large uh, heterogeneous groups in, uh, in, in protest movements, um, but not necessarily uh, purpose-built for coherence or, for instance, writing a constitution or policy making or uh, in later stages or other stages. From the idea that there are lots of people, lots of issues, lots of interests, and lots of uh, lots of positions in these groups, uh, the, the, design, the design goal was, all right, well, given, given this, can we proceed to identify um, patterns and, uh, and, and, and technology which might be built uh, more purposefully for collective intelligence and coherence? Can we apply machine learning to deliberative democracy? Polis began in 2012, uh, open source in 2016 in Taiwan at the GovZero conference and after the successful usage in vTaiwan uh, and became a nonprofit uh, in 2020. Polis is completely open source. It's deployed by governments around the world from uh, Amsterdam and Finland to Taiwan itself uh, and many others. And has been covered probably, probably the most uh, covered example is the case of Uber in the regulation uh, that Audrey, Audrey uh, pointed out that uh, has been used at national scale in Taiwan. One of the things that I'll just bookmark here for a little bit later in the discussion perhaps is that in this case, a, mach a machine learning uh, platform is 
utilized to regulate the uh, uh, an agent entering a country. Uh, Uber is a machine learning uh, agent that is routing traffic uh, 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 from, from point to point, right, in, in the case of, of taxis. Uh, and, and this means that things are moving very fast uh, in, in the adoption of the technology and the, it, at, at nation scale. The use of machine learning to regulate machine learning uh, technologies is, is particularly relevant and we can return to during the discussion. But I'll, I'll just bookmark here that that, that, that is perhaps, an, um, uh, if you've heard of this case study before in, in Taiwan, um, that is a, an angle which it's, it's, it's interesting to return to now, uh, especially uh, th th this month. Polis has been used around the world by large institutions as well, such as uh, UNDP uh, in Pakistan, Bhutan, and East Timor, with some of the largest um, deliberative exercises uh, in online polling in the uh, de developing world. Uh, in this case, there were uh, members of parliament who were in uh, tuk-tuks and uh, with phones, and so there's the possibility of both in-person uh, legitimized uh, usage of uh, of conversational technology, uh, and there's a, a major partner, and then there's a politician in in the in the vehicle, and then also the possibility because it's online of social spread uh, and around the country for uh, for gathering of perspectives uh, and coherence. So. Uh, other usages in, uh, around the world uh, include the United Kingdom, uh, Department of Education along with Policy Lab, which have used POLIS for collective intelligence exercises inside of the government to evaluate uh, views of civil servants. Uh, and also, um, of course, uh, with regards to Twitter. The Atlantic put out a piece uh, a little while back uh, around the potential for organizations such as Twitter to use uh, ideas from the the space uh, that 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 we've worked in in collective intelligence uh, for uh, the application of misinformation and and other things and about a year and a half ago um, Twitter got in contact with us and uh, and did indeed uh, adapt and had let us know that they had adapted uh, polis in their own open source code open data uh, into into community notes. Their paper is open. Uh, it's available. Uh, it was renamed from Birdwatch to Community Notes. And there is a, uh, a really nice write-up of all the open algorithms. Open code, open data, open algorithms can be audited um, by, by anybody in the media. And Bloomberg has already done so, for instance. Uh, and there's also a, uh, a bit of press from Wired uh, that breaks down the, the adoption and usage of the, uh, of, of, of the, of the technology. If you have an interactive, has anyone interacted with community notes? Has anyone participated in it? Amazing. So recently, one of the things that's also been launched is if you've seen something which later gets a note, right, and just briefly, uh, the idea here in community notes in this fact-checking system is that it's a crowd-based fact-checked system. The idea is to add one best consensus note that kind of gets consensus from among many different varieties of, uh, of ways that people have voted in the past. So you're taking a, uh, a space or a topology of a map of opinion, which is kind of a concept from Polis, and then uh, applying that to say, okay, well, can we, can we find a note that is, uh, that, that is evenly agreed upon by people who otherwise vote differently? One of the things that this that this gives them is that if you get a, a system that can run automatically like this, you can you can you can scale it very quickly laterally across the entire system, and they've done that, uh, which is um, very exciting in in general for the scalability of these kinds of systems. So we uh, also published a response to this about uh, regarding how it might be generalized, and it's also being studied by uh, Aviv, who will speak later uh, this 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 uh, tomorrow, I believe, uh, on on these topics and the concepts of bridge-based ranking uh, and generalizing the kind of conceptualization of what does it mean to look at populations and try to identify what is common uh, between groups that think differently. How can we formalize that and think about the way in which these systems might be more generalized? Very excited. So I'll speak briefly to a couple ideas, and we can return more in the discussion about what does it mean to have principles for technology, uh, to have a goal to go out to produce collective intelligence and coherence in a population, and then also to then how does that translate to an implementation. So uh, the scalable and uh, the idea that a platform would be scalable is not new, um, but the idea that a, sca uh, a platform would be both scalable and coherent um, is an important design constraint for Polis. The bigger it gets, it has to get better as it gets bigger. It has to get more coherent as it gets bigger. Uh, and another is from Marshall Rosenberg, who uh, pioneered the concept of nonviolent communication, which is that if you first show someone, uh, if you 
in a discussion or in a disagreement, uh, if you mirror someone's concept, uh, uh, their, their perspective back to them to let them know that they've been understood, uh, this can de-escalate conflict. And so one of the principles in Polis is to visualize uh, people's ideas back, back to them and uh, let them know they've been understood so that they can see that the system understands them and also understand uh, how the other groups feel as well. A brief look at the interface. Um, this is a, a very intentionally minimal interface that it can be translated into any language uh, and has been translated into over a couple dozen, I think, at this point. Uh, the system uh, takes in statements and then allows people to agree, disagree, and pass on statements submitted by others. The idea of this is that it produces an opinion matrix, which is a matrix of what everyone thought about what everyone wrote. Uh, and so a comment box might just be the statements. This is like a comment box and a, uh, and then voting on each comment, which produces an opinion matrix. And the idea of a survey that's created by the people taking it has both qualitative dimensions in that everyone gets to speak in their own words, and also quantitative dimensions in that there is then the ability to do subsequent analysis uh, in a quantitative way. Um, this particular kind of machine learning is called unsupervised learning, where we go out kind of into the data uh, and then cluster things by similarity and then ask how are these things, uh, how are these things alike, on what basis are they different. One of the examples, and I'll reference here Lisa's introduction, uh, where she spoke about lurking. Um, this is a German political party that used Polis to evaluate its own membership. It scales to 33,000 people. Even though there were only 783 statements, there are nearly 2 million votes. And so as a system grows, uh, we don't have to ask people to, to just speak or to write, which is a higher friction. We can also ask them to vote and position themselves, and thus uh, we can understand um, the, 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 what people think about what has been written, which allows us to, to catch a lot more of the information and, and lurkers. Same kind of principle in usage in, uh, in Canada at national scale, where there's a wide, uh, a wide geographic distribution of participation across the country, and not just writing, even though there's 570 statements, there's 43,000 votes. So this is uh, um, a, 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 something that a comment box on the internet, uh, which is kind of the standard for most governments, uh, won't, won't do. This can be used as a sub subsequently as an input to deliberative processes, um, and has a number, uh, though has a number of specific limitations, which I can come back to later. Um, I'll just make sure I get to everything else and we can return to in the discussion if it's interesting. The history of technology has a, a very, um a very rich interaction with uh, demographics. Early tabulating machines, early uh, analog computers, were, including the Hallworth uh, electric counting machine, were used to tabulate census data. Uh, UNIVAC was also, at Columbia University, uh, used to tabulate census data. One of the wonderful, uh, really a, a gift of a book from uh, Joe Lepore recently published, uh, How the Symbolmatics Corporation Invented the Future, uh, looks at uh, the kind of history of building models of the public will. Uh, and a really wonderful New York article I, would, uh, I can highly recommend the, uh, the, the, this view into potentially, we can see this as a, uh, as a view into an alternate timeline here, right, where the idea that the census is going along producing um, models of the public will, what might it mean for the public to build models of itself? Uh, to control the models that are built of itself, to use those in political processes like deliberations on new technologies that are in a country like Uber, uh, to use that for the purposes of depolarization. Um, and how do we build new systems around technologies uh, like Polis and others that durably return political agency, uh, which, which Shamil talked about uh, in his introduction, uh, and agenda setting power to the public. This is the goal that uh, we have in bringing machine learning to deliberative democracy at uh, the 501c3, uh, the Computational Democracy Project. And we, uh, we have a focus at CompDem uh, at maintaining the code, maintaining open source code base in Polis, and also organizing methods and training around that, uh, that code base so that people can use it effectively. Uh, data science can be difficult to implement. There's a lot of um, considerations, perhaps, if you're rolling it out in some circumstances. Uh, guiding those implementations is something that we do actively. And we also then take all of the uh, case studies, consider how the system might advance, give the new technologies, and turn that back around into uh, new, new code. So overall, I, you know, from our perspective, this is a generational opportunity to affect policymaking worldwide. Uh, if we reconsider how we create models of the public will, and we, create, uh, we consider and reconsider um, what systems and processes uh, we use to produce it, what the goals are and what the purposes of producing it, uh, we have a real shot at transforming uh, outcomes.
Thanks so much. Come and join me on the stage. So I want to just point out that Twitter's adoption of some of this polis code or this way of managing data um, really for content moderation is a different yeah. usage than you set out to. It's, it's, a, it's the application of deliberative methodologies to have an, a group of people online deliberate misinformation, deliberate is this misinformation or not. And that's really interesting because one of the things that it means is that they have implemented a very generalizable system of deliberation on, uh, on content, uh, which is exciting. Right, and it shows how a big tech company that has the scale to reach people can adopt something from a relatively open small, source community and open source, mm -hmm. uh, smaller tech company that's been designed with nonviolent communication, lessons from the Occupy movement and, and, and social movements. So it's very exciting. Um, in your wildest dreams, where would this go? I think the, the possibility of, of transforming policy making, and I mentioned that I, I believe this is a generational opportunity that, that we have. The, when we think about models of the public will, a, a comment system that the, that, that the government has on a, on a website on, um, you know, uh, is, is an example of that. But so is a party platform. Uh, and so when we think about Brexit as a referendum, that's a model of the public will. How are we, how are we bringing um, the public will into uh, uh, spaces that we consider politically legitimate? Uh, is, it, is it scalable? Is it geographically distributed? Um, is it coherent? Uh, who, who controls it? For what purpose was it done? I think that you know, transforming the, these kinds of systems and, uh, and, and ensuring that the algorithms are auditable, that they can be seen by everyone, that the algorithms themselves are open source, uh, is a kind of uh, particularly um, uh, enormous leverage point that we have in, in the next generation of building models of the public will. And that's okay, final question. You mentioned bridging-based ranking. Yeah. Can you explain that to the audience? Because it's a term we'll talk about more tomorrow as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll look, look forward to hearing uh, Aviv's presentation as well tomorrow. The idea is to, let's say, in, in, in our paper, when we describe polis, we called it group-informed consensus. That is to say, if we're going to take uh, an opinion matrix, a, a map of the realm, so to speak, in an opinion, opinion landscape, if we're going to produce that, and then we're going to cluster and say, OK, well, between these two, um, between these two groups, here are what they had in common, here's what they had uh, separate, uh, or here's what they disagreed on. If Twitter's going to take all of the notes on a, on a content or, or on, on a tweet and then consider which, uh, which, which tweet is going to be uh, um, the one which is, is, is uh, agreed on among people who are all, all over different parts of this landscape uh, of opinion. Bridge-based ranking is a really useful conceptualization and also formalization of how we can uh, think more abstractly about um, the, the algorithms themselves, but in, with the purpose of making them more generalizable. If we can study them and compare how they're performing in different contexts, then we can, uh, we can make progress uh, in, um, in considering how they might be adopted uh, more broadly. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. I think we'll move on now to Andrew Kanya, and you'll come back to the stage for audience questions at the end. So thank you so much. Andrew Kanya is the co-founder and CEO of a platform called Remesh, which has some similarities with Polis. Um, Andrew very much wanted to be here tonight. Um, on his LinkedIn page, it describes him as aiming to make the world better by solving problems in the intersection of people, math, and computers. He gave me permission to share with you all that he is currently under chemo, which is why he's not here with us in person tonight. His clinical description of the situation um, is that Andrew is undergoing chemo for late stage metastatic stable colon cancer. And I know we're a diverse group, but I said, you know, we need, we need Andrew in the world. Um, let's all ask the universe for some specific healing for his, for his situation. Andrew recorded a video for us tonight to explain how Remesh works in peace processes. And so we'll get that. And then I, I asked 
him a couple questions in which we have very short answers to. So let's have the first video from Andrew Konya. Back in 2012, I was a grad student in theoretical physics working on emerging phenomenon in complex systems. And I made a group of friends that ended up moving back home on either side of a conflict uh, in the Middle East. And over the course of a bit of time, uh, I watched these friends resolve a constant string of differences and tension uh, arising because of the conflict through the form of dialogue, live back and forth conversation. The conversation could move quick enough that they could keep up uh, with how the conflict uh, and the scenario was changing. Uh, the dialogue created empathy, so they viewed each other as humans. And the dialogue let them steer and weave and go everywhere they needed to go to try and resolve the differences and tensions that exist. So back again, uh, about a decade ago, uh, I then became obsessed uh, with this idea of trying to scale this dynamic uh, of live one-on-one -on -one dialogue uh, to an entire population uh, so that you could give a population a representative voice and let them participate in the conversations that were going to impact their future. And we started out uh, basically three core principles that drove how we were going to approach actually building this out. The first, obviously, is that we wanted to maintain the dynamics of one-on-one -on -one dialogue. It had to be dynamic, it had to be fully open-ended, it had to be able to happen in real time, and it had to be engaging enough to draw people in and drive empathy. Second was that we needed to be able to give honest representations of diverse populations. So we had to maximize accessibility, we had to make participants feel safe, we've got to minimize any forms of bias, we need to quantify the representativeness of anything that we're going to say, uh, we need to prioritize the mosaic of a diverse population over just a majority, and we need to test everything, including our algorithms, until they're trustworthy. And then the last is that we've got to make it easy for non-technical teams. Uh, in the context of peacekeeping, uh, there are teams on the ground operating that typically are going to collaborate together on this, and they may or may not uh, have someone who is actually highly technical. So we needed to make an approachable user interface. We needed to make the whole thing multiplayer so people could collaborate. We needed to help them manage the full dialogue life cycles. Uh, and we needed to provide industrial grade reliability and security because that is something that we wanted them to not have to actually worry about. So fast forward, uh, the past decade or so, uh, we spent tens of millions of dollars uh, building out a platform uh, with these principles uh, to achieve what we were aiming for. Um, a core component of that is how we represent populations. Uh, we use a bunch of AI that I won't talk about here, but the output of it uh, is that we get kind of three views or three lenses into a population. We get common topics, what people are saying in response to something. We get quantified representativeness, so we can quantify the amount of agreement any statement has. And then we can break that down by different segments of the population that understand consensus, bridging opinions versus polarizing, disruptive opinions. And then we can identify a span of perspectives that represents the whole group. So instead of just showing the majority, we find this responses that highlight even strongly held minority views as well. Then we take that uh, and put that into a platform that lets you have live back and forth uh, conversation with a crowd. And then uh, because we care about making the UI good and handling the process end to end, uh, we built out components uh, around just the dialogue itself, from inviting participants to creating the discussion guide, running the dialogue, and then analyzing and reporting. Um, though we've been working on this for over a decade, uh, it was only uh, about two and a half years ago in 2020 uh, where we actually got things to the point where uh, we trusted the product enough, it was battle tested, and we were uh, ready to use it uh, in high stakes situations, uh, and that's when we began piloting with the UN. All right, so this is a little geeky, these next two videos, but I asked Andrew to really go into more depth on the algorithms and the affordances in Remesh so that we can really try to understand, even those of us who are not technologists ourselves, how do the algorithms in Remesh help find common ground? 
And how does that compare with Polis? Because these are similar platforms that are sort of incentivizing people to see where they have similarities. And it's, it's that incentivization that's so different from the current algorithms that amplify the most divisive content. So the next video from Andrew answers the question about algorithms. So how do algorithms help find common ground? To first order, you can think of finding common ground as a search process. So for each prompt or question in a dialogue, you're going to get a bunch of statements, any of which may represent common ground, and then you want to find the consensus and bridging statements among those. Consensus statements are those where nearly every participant agrees with it, but these tend to be rare. Bridging statements are a little more common, and those are the ones where a significant portion of participants from each segment of the population agree with it. Rumor supports this by allowing the user to specify the properties of the segments they want to compare, and then we make it easy for them to find the bridging statements across those segments. For example, the UN might often specify these segments to align with the different sides in a conflict. Polis takes a slightly different and very clever approach, which is to automatically segment the participants based just on their voting behavior, and then enables the discovery of bridging statements across those emergent segments. So, Rumesh approach is great when you have known sides and you try to find common ground between those. But Polis's approach is great when you don't actually know what the different sides in the situation actually are, and you need to map those as part of the process. Either way, if you have all the statements and you know every participant's agreement with every statement, then finding common ground is doable. What makes the problem really hard, though, is that when you have upwards of thousands or tens of thousands of participants, then you have thousands or tens of thousands of statements. And it's not actually feasible to have all participants vote their agreement on all statements. This forces a trade-off between accepting low confidence on the assessment of every statement you could evaluate, or having to preferentially elicit votes on just a subset of statements so you can have confidence in those. The former decreases the chance that any of the common ground you find actually will represent reality, while the latter decreases the number of statements you even have a chance to find common ground in at all. Where Remesh's core algorithms come in is to relax this trade-off by learning to predict every participant's assessment of every statement with decent accuracy, 75 to 80%, while only needing a reasonable number of votes from each participant on the order of 10 to 20. This increases the likelihood that any common ground found is actually a reflection of reality while allowing every statement to be evaluated as a candidate for common ground equally. So that is very technical. If there's any of you who would like to ask more questions directly of Andrew, uh, we are setting up a Zoom channel, uh, a Zoom uh, webinar with him where you can ask more direct questions. I had one more short question for him, and that is, uh, both Remesh and Polis have been designed to reduce trolling and uh, to reduce emergent polarizing rhetoric on, on the platforms. So I asked him to just talk a little bit about the kinds of affordances that are on these platforms to discourage that kind of harmful content. So how do we reduce trolling and emergent polarizing rhetoric? Remesh doesn't allow participants to comment on others' responses. And we actually take this one step further and don't allow participants to respond to a prompt once they've seen the responses of others. This is meant to avoid the bad positive feedback loops that can emerge uh, from emotionally fueled polarizing rhetoric. But it comes at the cost of potentially limiting useful feedback loops around ideas which can build on one another in response to a single prompt. So instead, the moderator has to enable idea building over multiple prompts as a dialogue takes place. So for example, they might ask what quality is most important in a presidential candidate. They'll run learn from the group that it's integrity, and then they have to then follow up to ask more questions and dig deeper about what integrity means. We also have a feature which doesn't allow participants to submit a response if it has curse words or hate slurs or things like this. But our suggested practice is actually not to use this 
because it can suppress surfacing hard truths about what some population actually thinks. And even with all this, there's still risk that polarizing groupthink can emerge from one dialogue cycle to the next, or even just from the exposure to other responses during voting. We try to minimize the chance that this happens, though, by using strictly random sampling. So there's no chance for corrupting feedback dynamics between participant behaviors and the information that they see. All right, thanks so much. That's Andrew Konya, and uh, we'll be announcing that webinar with him. I'll invite Shamo back on stage to introduce our next speaker. So um, I'm happy to welcome Danish Masood. I think he's coming out. This side. hi, Danish. Please come out and join us. Technologist with the United Nations and an old friend of mine as well. Great to have you. Um, you're going to hear a presentation from you, and then you and I are going to have a short conversation. Sounds great. Sounds great, Danish. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, Shamal and, and company. Um, so uh, my name is Danish. I'm with the uh, United Nations Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs. And we are the part of the UN most concerned with bringing armed conflict to an end using preventive diplomacy and uh, analysis in order to make sure that we're able to address rising tensions or anticipate them. Uh, we often respond to mandates from the UN Security Council, which is the premier international body charged with maintaining peace in the world. And within that, I help run a unit uh, which basically looks at emerging technologies and sees how they can be repurposed for peacemaking use cases around the world in a way that supports the work of our colleagues on the ground in conflict zones. And today, I'm going to be showing you some of what we're up to. Now, just by way of context, in terms of what, you know, what we're dealing with, we have a changing global security architecture, by which you know, we mean a number of things. But obviously, you guys have been paying attention to the war that is ongoing in Europe, unfortunately, which has changed uh, international dynamics when it comes to peace and security. Uh, the collapsing climate, growing global mistrust, which we've talked about, the spread of disinformation, uh, dark side of the digital world, and of course, uh, the infodemic. Now, within that, we're, we're kind of looking at a number of areas that uh, um, are interesting or useful to us from a peacemaking perspective. Um, uh, one of the areas that I'm going to be diving deeper into is our ongoing collaboration with Remesh and Andrew. Uh, uh, and that, that, you know, broadly we refer to as digital dialogues or AI-assisted digital dialogues in conflict contexts. But in addition to that, we're also using all kinds of um, sort of listening tools, speech-to-text tools, for those of you that know about them, and I can say more for right in the question and answer session, we're also using um, satellite data, both imagery as well as uh, data generated by different onboard sensors on different satellites in order to uh, evaluate risks related to climate fragility. For example, one of the things that we focus on is how uh, water availability is changing in places like the Middle East, and it's uh, going to has the potential to potentially you know, cause displacement or unrest. So we'll be talking a little bit more about that. Um, I'll skip that. So on to the first example, which is our dialogue that we held in Libya. So in brief, we've deployed uh, uh, these AI-assisted dialogues in uh, uh, a broad range of countries, uh, Iraq, Yemen, Libya, Bolivia, Lebanon, Haiti, among others. And uh, in such instances, basically, we've, we've used Remesh, which Andrew just described, in order to better understand where a local population uh, is at on a range of polarizing issues. When it comes to a political process or a peace process that is ongoing in a conflict context, it's not always straightforward to be able to have a real-time sense of what people are feeling. Uh, traditionally, what's been used in the past is um, polls, but polls are static, and they're expensive, and they're slow, and it takes a long time often to uh, process the 
the data that comes in, even with a computer-assisted telephone interview style polling system. But with Remesh, we're able to see in real time how people are feeling, and we're able to run these dialogues every day, or sometimes twice a day. Right? And what that does is it allows us to see, uh, in, in terms of the dynamics of an ongoing political process, how people's positions are changing, as segmented by different demographic groups that are of interest to us. And then, of course, in real time, we can dig much deeper. When people say something, when we discover, for example, an unknown unknown, which may be a point of agreement among polarized populations or a point of disagreement. We can dig much deeper. We can also segment and ask, uh, or we can actually ask one segment why and not the other, for example. So, so this type of work was extremely useful in the context of Libya for us uh, in, in, the, in the Libyan political dialogue forum because we were able to, um, in, in addition to the, the, the sheer benefit of being out there listening to what people are saying and having the most senior UN person, in this case Stephanie Williams, the uh, SRSG formerly and then the special envoy of the Secretary General, listening to the public directly, engaging with them in a chat directly and being seen to be doing this, which by the way was also funnily enough broadcast on Libyan TV, bottom, left, bottom right corner, um, um, as almost like a sports event with commentary. Which was, which was very interesting for us, which we didn't expect, by the way. Anyway, but, but the point is that, you know, just as a very simple example, when an interim government was put into place, or the idea of an interim government came up, we, at, we said, what are some of the questions you'd like to ask candidates that are running for in the interim government, right, for different positions? We took the questions they gave us, and we posed those questions to the candidates on live TV. Right? So this is the value of using Remesh in these types of contexts, or using these types of, uh, uh, basically, dialogue tools. Uh, this, is, this is an example from Yemen. You might, have, you might recognize this image. Andrew also showed it. Now, in addition to that, <coughs> for uh, in a lot of situations where you have mis and, mis and disinformation that's being spread um, uh, you know, at different points, at different inflection points. So for example, when uh, an electoral cycle is ongoing, you have the possibility of a lot of disinformation being spread, as we all know well here. Um, and in such instances, there are ways for us to use different uh, sort of computational techniques and tools many of which are uh, broadly drawn from computational social science and internet research methods, right? To look at large volumes of data that have been scraped, for example, from YouTube comments, or Twitter, or, or, or Facebook, or Telegram, or in the context of, of uh, uh, countries where Russian is spoken, we contact you. Right? We can scrape some of those conversations and analyze them using different techniques such as word co-locations, word embeddings, other things. I don't want to get into a technical discussion around it, but that is extremely useful for us because it enables us to detect political signals in online discussions and better understand where, how things might be getting more polarized and what the various camps are in a particular uh, context. So for example, we've done this kind of work in the context of, of analyzing uh, social media in Brazil, right? And uh, that was also extremely useful for us uh, in order to better understand some of the positions that were being taken up that were um, uh, by different actors against the sustainable development agenda of the United Nations. There, these are just examples of different tools that we've used. Now, one other, one other thing that I want to say that broadly relates to this area is that in, in many parts of the world, internet penetration is low uh, or limited. Only elites use Twitter. So we need to be able to, at scale, also mine radio and TV data. Right? Now, this is challenging for us because um, uh, in many of those contexts, the resources, the, for those of you that know a little bit about natural language processing, this is called the low resource language problem, right? Because the resources to train algorithms uh, to, quote, 
be able to analyze or understand what's being said, to take, let's say, uh, audio and video communications and to transcribe them and then to analyze them, those resources are very limited. And there are no good business uh, um, related reasons or commercial reasons for those resources to be developed. So in those contexts, we have invested over several years to develop large corpora. Think of these as large dictionaries for computers and algorithms to be able to understand lesser spoken dialects. And in that regard, because we have a high, uh, a, a higher density of field presences in um, countries where Arabic is spoken, We've developed a, a resource that uh, is able to analyze 19 different Arabic dialects and um, uh, take audio content or video content, transcribe it, um, uh, and uh, analyze it using these automated speech recognition algorithms. Another area that we're interested in is, of course, geospatial analysis. Um, and, and I referenced this earlier. Basically, they're... they're Many, many satellites that are constantly orbiting the Earth that are collecting reams of data and information about how our planet is changing. Uh, one of the points of entry or interest for us is looking at multidimensional complex risk factors related to climate change. Right? And in, in places like Iraq, for instance, uh, where uh, you have the Tigris-Euphrates Basin, which is one of the most stressed water tables in the world in terms of the number of cubic meters of water available per capita. Now, moving forward, when you project how things are going, there might be displacement, there might be fighting over resources, there might be unrest related to water and water access. In fact, that's already happening in some parts of the country. So, using some of these onboard satellites, uh, sensors that are onboard Earth orbiting satellites, we're able to measure things such as the presence of groundwater, the, uh, the greenness of the vegetation, using, which is something called NDVI for anyone who works on geospatial issues here, um, mean temperature, other things like that. And then we can connect that. And here it's key to say that we don't think that there's a causal relationship between social unrest and climate change, but we're able to look at correlations that are vital for us. Um, I'll, I, I won't go on too much longer. I mean, one, one other thing that's worth mentioning here is that as a department, one of the key things we do is provide briefings to, to important decision makers. Right? Uh, uh, we, we write reports for the UN Security Council, for example, which is the premier body charged with maintaining international peace in the world. And so we often find that for reasons related to security, cost, logistics, the pandemic, decision makers that are making consequential decisions about conflict zones around the world are unable to travel there. there. And so increasingly we've, we started using immersive technologies in order, uh, as, a, as a form of supplementary briefing in order to give people an objective feel for what it's like to be on the ground. The first one that we put together uh, a few years ago was, was something I filmed in Iraq called Iraq 360, which we used to brief experts on the Security Council. Since that time, of course, it's, it's uh, it's, uh, it's actually been used in, um, uh, in the Security Council chamber, which Shamil showed earlier, um, itself, uh, in order to brief people. This was a briefing under the presidency of Norway on the situation in Colombia. The, the final thing that's kind of maybe just as a fun thing, since I've bored you guys with so much tech stuff um, <laughs> that, I'll, that I'll just talk about momentarily that you guys might not associate with, with, with an organization like ours or with, with a team like mine is, is the use of sci-fi, right? So one of the things we're interested in is how do we, uh, uh, you know, think about possible futures, likely futures, desirable futures, undesirable futures, and how do we reverse engineer looking at that subset of desirable futures from, how do we reverse engineer from there to the present, right? That's, 
very interesting to us. In addition to that, use, using speculative techniques to think about the future, to think about how conflict will change, how conflict might in fact become much more algorithmic, for example, how technology will change, and indeed how the business of making peace around the world will change. So in that vein, we've worked with several artists and thinkers and futurists to have conversations internally uh, about uh, how, how all these things uh, you know, what are the different pathways here that, that the world could go in, right? For example, and this is the very last thing I'll say since I've run out of time, one of the things that's potentially interesting to us is uh, uh, using some of the techniques that our friends from Polis and Remesh talked about earlier to actually better understand where two parties that are in conflict with each other might agree. By putting in, let's say, training the algorithms on the positions of party one and party two, where you have a two-party conflict, you can begin to see what areas uh, or concepts or ideas the two parties agree on that they're not aware that they agree on. Right? And that can be s extremely interesting in launching a political process. And these are some of the things that we're in increasingly exploring with large language models and natural language processing. Uh, that's my time. Thank you so much. So, Donish, thank you, and my apologies to Donish and you all for the hand-handed introduction. I was interrupted when I came out to introduce uh, Donish, but you're, you're in the innovation cell of the Department uh, for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs at the UN. Uh, we're late on time, so I'm just going to ask you two questions. Um, the first is, so you've laid out some of the ways in which the, um, the UN is investing in these technologies to better understand dynamics um, and to advance peace processes, et cetera. What is the UN looking for from the tech sector when you hear, um, what do you hear from your colleagues that we wish we could do more of this, we wish we could get more of that? What are you, what are you hearing that they would like to see more from? I, I think we're, we're looking for more partnership and we're looking to develop technology together. You know, for example, I showed you a lot of stuff around uh, uh, basically uh, computational linguistics or human language and, and algorithms and natural language processing, etc. Uh, another example is machine vision. Uh, you know, we have mandates around the world to monitor ceasefires, and using satellite imagery, we're able to detect. Uh, the violation of ceasefires uh, when, when uh, you know, basically shelling happens, for example, or small arms exchanges, those kinds of things. But in order to be able to do, to, to do that kind of work, we need to train machine vision algorithms uh, to be able to detect the telltale signs, right? And so uh, because we do have some capability internally that we didn't have, that we're not known for, that we're increasingly developing, we're actually able to, to co-develop tools and co-create tools with our partners in the tech community, and that's increasingly uh, you know, what we're seeking to do. Great, thank you. Um, the, the other question that I had for you is, um, in some way it's, it's related to one of the things that Dr. Shirk was mentioning that uh, some uh, tech sector leaders say about their platforms, which is that you know, a lot of the harms, it's not about us, this is, this is about the users and, and their behavior, we're, we're, we're just a mirror for that. In the UN, and as you know, I used to work in the UN as well. Um, Shamal was my first boss at the UN, by the way, <laughs> just for context. So, um, uh, I'm not responsible for what happened since. No, so, um, you know, in the UN, you hear, um, hey, um, it's not the UN, uh, it's the member states. Uh, we're just as good as they enable us to be. Um, what is your assessment um, I don't mean this is the, this stupid joke about the UN and innovation that go well together or whatever. I mean, w w one of the big concerns is that governments are largely led by older generations um, still to this day. And the ability of those generations and those leaders to understand and get a grip with and, and also to some extent regulate or, or utilize or partner with. What is your assessment from where you, you sit of how this is evolving, the capacity of governments to engage effectively with tech, tech for good, tech for bad, for all of it? What is your assessment of how that is evolving? 
mean, frankly, I, I think the, the discussion has gotten a lot more advanced. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a lot more hopeful than I was previously. Um, and um, I think that's because a, a huge pedagogical effort has been undertaken by, by I think, you know, the academic community, by the NGO community, by us internally. We now have a, a, an office of the Tech Envoy uh, inside the UN. You know, just as an example, the advent of ChatGPT has been so interesting in terms of the internal discourse because increasingly uh, there is a discussion on alignment. Uh, uh, which is, I know, very common in, 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 in the Valley, but inside the UN, people don't often talk about alignment in terms of how do we get, uh, how do we get AI to do or align with what our intention, what our core intentions are in terms of what it should be doing, right? And, and so uh, those discussions are becoming uh, more sophisticated. But I, I still think that we have a long way to go, and uh, we're doing what we can in terms of ourselves through the innovation sub, but also through the office of the tech envoy. Great, thanks, Danish. So I know we want to move to our final session. Christian, you can come back out. I think Danish, I'm not sure who's staying or going, but I know I'm staying. Yeah, we're both staying. Come on out, Christian. Right. How are we doing so far? It's good. Great, so we have reached our Q&A session and uh, how we're going to do it. We'll start by first talking amongst ourselves. So I would want you to talk to your neighbor. In the next three minutes, we will try to weigh some of the questions that have emerged to you throughout the presentations. And then afterwards, I will ask two ushers. We'll have uh, three questions only as all the speakers come back on the stage to, to answer some of the questions that we have. All right, so let's have the conversation first amongst ourselves, and then we'll get back to the panelists.
All right. By the look of the atmosphere in the room, the conversations are really very interesting, and I'm glad to see that groups are forming. But now we'll try to turn to our panelists and uh, only have three questions. So don't feel shy. The mics will be working around. And uh, yeah, first come, first serve. Hi, hi. Uh, my name is Javier. Uh, thank you for putting all this together. Really appreciate it, and I'm looking forward to meeting everyone here. Uh, my question is for Polis and Remish, uh, kind of thing. Well, not that. <laughs> uh, I'm actually kind of curious. Has anyone in Congress or at the top of the executive branch reached out to you guys to use your systems, and how so, and all of that jazz? Great question. I wish Andrew were here. Um, the answer is yes, but I'm going to have to let Andrew speak to that. I, I think you should come to the Zoom and ask him directly. Um, the answer from the congressional, moderation, uh, uh, congressional modernization side is there is some interest and activity on our side. Um, we've also discussed with a uh, um, number of regulators, and so there is interest. There's also barriers to bringing open source technology into government. Um, the barriers for procurement are very high, and the joke in Code for America is that everyone starts out uh, with a mission and then ends up a procurement geek. So I'll pass it. <laughs> Thanks. A um, lot of things bubbling up, but I wanted to. Oop. Okay. Um, I feel like. A lot of the technology that we're talking about here is sort of in the vein of seeing like a state where we're like trying to make things into ways that we can scale and numerically calculate things without looking at the actual need to heal and to do the truth and reconciliation work and to have that be supported by technology. Um, so I just want to throw that out there because I am seeing that being a deficit here. Thanks. Tomorrow we'll definitely be delving into more of those topics. What's really fascinating to me that I think people often assume that platforms have to be actually building relationships between people and, and doing the face to, or the actual dialogue in order to build social cohesion. And what Remesh and Polis tell me is that actually by showing people where there's common ground, which is really a perception issue, um, you can you can get pretty far toward building trust just with some of these this computational democracy yes So a specific, that's a, that's a great, that's a, a great question and a great point. A specific example that I could offer from uh, the Taiwanese case study is that there was a, we might consider it in the United States like mothers against drunk driving against like, um, let's have a national digital license, like driver's license crowds. These two groups were at each other's um, throats for about six years over the issue of whether online alcohol sales should be legal. There was no space, despite them being at two different ministries, for them to interact with each other. Uh, and this is not a, kind of reconciliation situation, but it's perhaps illustrative. The, the consensus was that um, online alcohol sales was not going to increase any access. It was already access. Uh, and no one disagreed that there should be more treatment and prevention. No one, in fact, disagreed that there should be a national ID. These groups had not, there was one law where they were both opposed, but in fact, there was no space for them to kind of express each other's opinions and interact with each other's opinions, which is perhaps illustrative on the, um, on the potential for that. One last question. Okay, We're, who should ask it? All right. Um, all, hi, my name is Monica. Um, we're working on a project called Constellations, and it's uh, basically to do that with social movements, to do bring social cohesion. But one of, in our discovery process, talking to a lot of activists and a lot of movement leaders, is that um, you know social cohesion is to solve the problem of social divide or polarization. And so by that nature, people are decentralized when they're divided. So by social cohesion, we have to 
centralize them. In authoritarian in governments that are not really, you know, liking that, we have, um, you know, like Marie Ressa of uh, Rappler, right, where she was charged with, I mean, Nobel Peace Prize winner with cybercrime, um, by cybercrime laws, cyber libel laws, um, infiltration, surveillance. And so my question is, as we're trying to gather people together, even using a hashtag, right, like gather people together, are we putting a red marker black mark on them where they're actually more vulnerable and are seeking resilience. We're actually making them less resilient because they're centralizing themselves and working together. And so how do we solve that? Because um, at, this is a big problem online that maybe in person you're not going to, maybe you'll have that, but you can maybe hide somewhere or something. But um, it's very big. And, and especially with infiltration, like how do you guard where people are not coming into that space? Collaborators, right? We don't have a good answer for you. Um, I mean, I will just say uh, from from our experience, and good to see you here, Monica. Um, um, even outside of the digital space, uh, when you're trying to connect people, as you know, um, for collaborative action, security is always a question uh, in, in different settings. And in the digital space, you had this on the one hand, this paradox of oh, now people can connect as never before. And oh yes, oh now autocratic regimes can track them as never before. And so this is playing out everywhere. So I don't have a good answer for you. And um, I think there are probably people here from the tech sector who know some of the tools and techniques that have been used to, to try to protect people. Um, I w will tell you that from our experience and some of our collaboration with um, even some of the bigger uh, platforms in certain contexts, um, uh, after the Taliban takeover to, of, of Afghanistan, for instance, um, affordances were added or measures were taken that significantly helped to um, secure the safety uh, of, of, of activists, uh, peace activists and others uh, in, in countries. But there's, uh, there's, there's nothing systemic that I'm aware of that enables that to happen regularly. It's uh, more of the exception than the rule from my experience, but that's the best answer I can give you for now. Thank you, thank you very much. Let's give them a round of applause again. I would like to stress one thing, that this conversation is not ended, and uh, that we will continue this conversation. We'd like to continue it with you. And uh, if you would like to join us, uh, please check our Facebook page. Uh, there is a page that we started just to keep this conversation going. You can post your comment, you can post a question, and we'll make sure to revisit it. And also one thing, uh, if you are not joining us uh, for tomorrow, you can check our pro social design Slack community, where we'll continue having this conversation in the long term. And with that, uh, as we are running a little bit behind schedule, I want to thank you so much again this evening for coming, and for the active participation, why don't you give yourself a round of applause.